Welcome to the Neutral Corner for the week of June 27th. I'm your host, Michael Montero. Let's get right into the ring walk. Now remember, if you guys have a question, hit me up on any of my handles, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube right here with the, the comments section below. If you'd like me to plug your YouTube page or your Twitter page or whatever, mention that in your question. If you want me to uh, keep your name hidden or whatever, that's fine too, just let me know. But this week's question comes from Antonio8904, and he wants to know, is there any truth to the rumor that Al Heyman and the PBC have dropped over $140 million so far? Yeah, so uh, I've heard that figure too. It's actually, I think, $145 million. I'm sure you guys have seen stuff going around uh, talking about that. Uh, look, this hasn't been confirmed, and Al Heyman and his people are really, really secretive about their business. The thing you gotta remember is, it's only been three months, right? It started, the PBC started, I think, on March 7th. And there hasn't been an official fiscal quarter yet. So I think it's a little premature to start speculating about those kind of numbers. If it's true, that's really, really uh, a bad sign because that's one third of the money, essentially, that Al Heyman's uh, investors put up uh, the numbers the reported numbers that they put up is about 450 million dollars supposedly there's a two to three year investment with these tv buyouts and stuff like that look i'll, I'll just say this okay al Heyman's a smart guy his investors his partners they're all smart people these people are billionaires you don't get to be a billionaire if you're not smart they had to know going into this thing that they were going to drop money the first year there's no way this PBC thing is gonna make any money the first fiscal year. If you look at the way Al Heyman structures most of his big deals, the big money comes in on the back end. I'll use Floyd Mayweather's contract with Showtime as an example, right? Six fight deal, they had a certain uh, amount that was guaranteed for each fight, and, and Showtime lost money on three of the four fights they had up until this Mayweather-Pacquiao fight. So. Up front, you know, they had Guerrero. They made money on the Canelo one, but the two Maidana fights, they lost money. Heyman, Mayweather, Showtime, everybody involved knew that on the back end, they had that Pacquiao fight. That was there. And when the numbers weren't looking good, Showtime and CBS, they, they came to Heyman and Mayweather and said, look, you gotta make this fight or you don't, you don't have a fifth or sixth fight with us, bottom line. So they made the fight. And now everybody made money. Mayweather on his sixth fight of the deal, that's probably gonna lose money too. It doesn't matter. They made enough with the Pacquiao fight to cover their bases. So I think that's what Heyman's thinking here with this PBC thing, that they're gonna build this brand up over the first year or so, and then on the back end, there's gonna be big pay-per-view fights to come down the line. I'm not so sure that's gonna happen because you gotta have the stars to build those fights up, but let's give it time. I'll just say this, okay? If you want to crunch some quick numbers, the most commercially successful PBC fight so far was that premiere between Thurman and Guerrero. That was that first card, I think again on March 7th, don't quote me on that date. But the, the gate did just over a million dollars and it was about 9,800 tickets sold. That's from the Nevada State Athletic Commission. But the fighter paydays were $4.5 million, okay, for all the fighters on the card. And then you gotta figure this, Heyman is buying the TV time. The network isn't paying him, right? That's usually how this works on like HBO and Showtime and whatnot. So 4.5 to pay the fighters, then you gotta get the venue, you gotta promote the thing, all the commercials, and then you buy the TV time and you're only getting a million dollars from the gate. And that's the most successful card they've had so far. Of course, you're getting money from, from uh, sponsors and advertisers as well, but we don't know how much that is. So there's a whole lot I could talk about with this PBC thing. Good, bad, ugly. I have some criticism so far. I do think they're doing some things right. If you guys want me to make a video strictly about the PBC and uh, some of the numbers behind it the first three months, let me know. Comment below and let me know if you'd like to see that. For now, we'll just get on with the neutral corner. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of information I could give here about ratings, and uh, market shares, stuff like that. So if you'd like to see that, let me know. So last Saturday, there were three big cards here on this side of the pond. 
And let's start with uh, Andre Ward's return. He fought the unheralded Paul Smith. And for those of you who don't know, Smith weighed in at 176 pounds uh, Friday, the day of the weigh-in, right? This was supposed to be a 172 pound catch weight. So he was fined $45,000 on the spot. The two camps agreed to a 181 pound Saturday check-in. And Smith blew that. He came in at 184 Saturday morning. So he had to pay another 15 grand directly to Andre Ward. So I think his purse was a little over $200,000. He ended up having to pay out 60,000 of that. Andre Ward for his work got $2 million, which is interesting because there's a lot of people that complain about some other fighters I've made videos about that don't make anywhere near that. And they fight tougher opponents than this, but whatever, I'll let that go. Anyway, Ward got $2 million. Apparently there were over 9,000 in attendance at the Oracle Arena there in Oakland, Andre Ward's hometown. Now, I don't know uh, if that includes comps. I don't know how many comps there were, but I do know for sure there were several, several discount packages. There was even a church discount. I don't know exactly what that is, but there is an Andre Ward church discount for tickets to this fight. But they got 9,000 butts in the seats. That I think that's a record for Andre Ward. So there was some demand to see him get back in the ring. Uh, look, this fight went pretty much the way everybody thought it would. It was a one-sided, I don't want to say beat down. It started kind of as a sparring session. Ward, you could you could tell, he, he wanted to kind of uh, carry Smith a few rounds and get some of the rust out. When it started to get into the later rounds, Ward really did start to break him up. And it looked like Smith's uh, nose got busted. Uh, there were no knockdowns or any serious moments where, where Smith looked really, really badly hurt. But eventually in the ninth round, the corner threw the towel in and that was that. Interesting note about this. This was, uh, of course, Andre Ward's first fight with Rock Nation, right? And this was a time buy with BET. I did not know that this was a time buy. So I'm not sure what Rock Nation's uh, business plan is with Ward, but this first fight was a time buy. I don't have any information about the ratings, but they couldn't have been good because I was just watching Twitter the whole day during all these cards and nobody was talking about this fight. But Andre Ward gets back in the ring, back in the win column. I don't really know what this does for him other than shake off some rust. Is he gonna be able to get down to super middleweight? I don't know. Okay, so there was a, a PBC card on NBC. Uh, the Battle of Ohio, Sean Porter took on Adrian Bronner in Las Vegas. Now, look, I talked earlier about some of the PBC's issues, okay? To me, this is one of their key issues. This fight should have been in Ohio and specifically in Cincinnati, where Adrian Bronner is from, where he's fought before and where he's sold very well. Here's a, a point about that, okay? The, the average rating for this broadcast was a 1.86. That's the Nielsen rating. Now by comparison, the Thurman Guerrero PBC card did a 2.53. But here's what's inter interesting. Of the top 10 single markets, as far as the cities in America where this broadcast did the highest ratings, the highest rating in the nation was in, guess where? Cincinnati, where it did a 4.1 rating. So nationally, Porter Broner did a 1.86 rating. In Cincinnati, it did a 4.1 rating. What does that tell you? That's where this fight should have been. So this is one of those things that Al Heyman and the guys at the PBC gotta work out. Location is everything when it comes to boxing and the audience. That crowd atmosphere, that shows through the television screen and it makes a big difference. But anyway, there are reported over 8,000 in attendance uh, it, at the MGM Grand in Vegas for this fight. I know for sure that there were thousands of comps because uh, Heyman and his crew, they used a, a service in Vegas that basically fills stadiums for events. And look, a lot of people do this. Hal Heyman's not the only one that's done it before in boxing. Uh, people do it in all different types of events, okay? But I have mixed feelings about giving out away free tickets because historically, when other promoters have done this, it, it, it sets a precedent where fans start to expect gimmies. They start to expect freebies. If you're gonna build a brand, you gotta charge something, even if it's 10 bucks, 20 bucks. But 
whatever. Again, I can do that in another video if you guys want to see it. All right, uh, Mayweather was actually the co-promoter for this fight, Floyd Mayweather. He was sitting there in the audience. <clears throat> the fight itself, look, um, Adrian Broner, to me, it didn't look like he had any kind of game plan. People complain about Floyd holding. They complain about Vladimir Klitschko holding. Broner held to the point where it looked like he was a wrestler. I thought he was an MMA fighter or something. It was beyond the level of, of extreme, okay? It was pathetic. There were several rounds where a point should have been docked. Finally, Tony Weeks took a point in the 11th round. And that seemed to wake Broner up because in the 12th and final round, he scored a knockdown off a clean, I believe it was a left hook, where Porter was just feeling so comfortable, he stood there with his hands down. But this was an ugly fight, as I predicted the week before. I did, I thought Broner would win a, a controversial split decision type of thing, but it, this fight wasn't even competitive. You wanna look at the punch numbers? Look, Porter threw 590 punches, landed 149. Broner threw 309 punches, landed 88. Look, Broner, the problem, he's a welterweight. He's throwing 25 punches a round. Not gonna get it done. You know, Broner made 1.35 million for this. Porter made 1 million. Um, I don't think we'll see Broner make a million dollars again. At least we shouldn't, until he wins a credible fight against a top level opponent. When's the last time Broner has decisively beat a top level opponent? I can't think of anything in recent memory that stands out. Uh, look, on, on the co-feature, Errol Spence fought. Obviously, he's the best prospect that the PBC has. He's the best prospect under Al Heyman's stable. But this fight against Phil LoGreco, it didn't prove anything, right? That's really not Errol Spence's fault. The fighter he's supposed to face, Roberto Garcia, dropped out during the week because it was rumored he weighed upwards of 175 pounds. This is actually the second time this has happened with Roberto Garcia. So if I'm Al Heyman, I'm not working with that fighter again. He's pulled this several times. And you know, I think sadly, Garcia is gonna end up being one of those sad boxing stories. It just, there's some mental issues or something going on there. When you're 30 pounds over where you're supposed to be, that shows that you're not even training. So the guys, you know, they shot that corner to corner preview show for the PBC and you know, they showed uh, Garcia supposedly training, I, I don't know. He didn't look like he could possibly weigh that much in that little preview show. So he must have gained weight in camp. That was a mess. But Spence looked outstanding, obviously, against the uh, last second replacement. Uh, but that didn't really do anything for him. My concern with Spence is that he's going to go the route that several other Al Heyman prospects have gone in recent years, where they're just not built up the right way. Al Heyman, one of the things that you know he doesn't do very well historically is build prospects. So hopefully they start putting Spence in there with some tougher guys so he can start learning something in the ring. And lastly, uh, Saturday night in Montreal, the fight that I thought was easily the fight of the night, right? And I talked about this the week before that this was going to be the one. David Lemieux wins a vacant title against Hassam Nadam. This was the former title that Jermaine Taylor held before he went batshit insane. This was a great action fight, and I gotta say, it's all thanks to Hassam Nadam. This guy was dropped four times, but he had a second win, and I thought he looked fresher in the championship rounds than David Lemieux looked, and he absolutely deserves another opportunity in a big fight. For Lemieux, Lemieux does one thing. He comes out and tries to knock you out. He's a search and destroy guy. He fights very flat-footed. There's not much uh, craft there. But he knew he couldn't let Nadam get comfortable early on in this fight, so he took it right to him early. Like I said, scored four knockdowns, uh, did what he was supposed to do. And Nadam had a very similar fight with Peter Quillen, where he was actually dropped six times. The difference is, against Peter Quillen, Nadam won a lot of rounds. And if it weren't for those knockdowns, Nadam won the majority of the other rounds where he wasn't dropped. And if it wasn't for those knockdowns, he would have beat Peter Cullen. In this fight, I thought Lemieux decisively won. And uh, he won a unanimous decision on the cards. 
Look, so what's next for Lemieux? Um, of course, Monday morning, Tom Loeffler at K2 Promotions was calling Golden Boy Promotions, talking about a possible fight between Lemieux and Gennady Golovkin. I, I'd love to see that fight, just like all of you guys. I think it would be the toughest test for Triple G to date because it'd be the hardest puncher he's fought as a pro. The thing is, I don't know if Team Lemieux is gonna wanna go there quite yet. I tend to give new titleists the benefit of the doubt when they want one soft touch to make a little bit of money. You know, they've worked their butt off, they just got a title, okay. They wanna do a fight up in Montreal that's more of a showcase fight, fine. So maybe that's where Lemieux will go next. But after that, they really should make a fight with Triple G. I gotta say this, if, if you're HBO, why didn't you pick up this fight? Even if, uh, you know, you worked out some kind of tape delay or you put it on HBO Latino, I don't know. I know these guys weren't Latino, but something, right? This was on Fox Sports 2. Not Fox, not Fox Sports, not Fox Sports 1, Fox Sports 2. So not many people saw this fight, and that's a shame because, as I said, it was clearly the fight of the night, and this is the one that fans should have seen for free. But that's all of last week's action. Now let's get into this week's stuff. Okay, so this Saturday at the StubHub Center, Timothy Bradley, former pound-for-pound top-level fighter, former titleist, takes on the undefeated Jesse Vargas. And this is going to be at the StubHub Center, the site of many great fights, the site of Bradley's fight of the year against Ruslan Provodnikov not long ago. I'm expecting this to be actually a pretty good fight, and I'll tell you why. Neither guy can punch through a wet paper bag. Usually, that means it's not gonna be a fun fight, but these two guys throw in volume, especially Bradley. And Bradley will take one to land one. And I think Bradley is uh, on a mission to prove he's still got it, right? He was on pound for pound lists for the past few years. He's, he had a tough run last year. Um, he's had some tough fights. He's taken a lot of punishment. Now, I don't think Bradley's the same guy he was during the first Pacquiao fight. I think that the tough fights with Provodnikov and others, where he's taken a lot of punishment, it's worn him down. And I think that the, the Timothy Bradley we saw in the rematch with Pacquiao, I, I personally felt had declined slightly. Maybe my eyes were deceiving me. We will find out this Saturday. Jesse Fargus doesn't know how to lose. You know, that's one thing you can say about him. I know he doesn't punch very hard, but he hasn't lost yet. And, and a, you got a young guy like that who doesn't know how to lose. You got to make him learn how to lose, right? Bradley's going to have to get his respect early on. And uh, that's going to mean he's going to have to step up the output. And then Vargas is going to have to respond to that. To say, hey, old man, I'm here. That's why I think this is going to be a good fight, even though neither guy can really punch that hard. Look, this venue, there's something about it. Bradley's already had great fights there. Both guys got something to prove. This is kind of the fading veteran versus the new upstart. You'd think that the promoter and the network would like to see Vargas kind of win this fight so that he can go to that next level. And if Vargas does beat Bradley, it gives Manny Pacquiao a comeback opponent to come back against next year. So uh, I think that's kind of where they want it to go. And Bradley probably knows that. He's been in this business for a while. He knows how these guys think. He's got something to prove here. So if Bradley's got one last real big performance in him, I think it's happening this Saturday. If I had to make a prediction here... Um, even though I just spent a few minutes talking about how much everybody wants Vargas to probably win, I'm going to go with Bradley because he's just been one of my favorite fighters the past few years. I think he's one of the real good guys in boxing. He does it the right way. He's 24-7 with his training and everything else. And uh, what can I say? I'm rooting for him here. I think that he obviously has a lot more experience. He's been in there with the top guys. And he wants that one last big fight. And he, to do that, he not only has to win Saturday, he's got to look good. So I'm going to go with Bradley by decision here. 